May 30th, 1981, Washington, D.C. A man lurks in a hidden corner of the exterior of the city's Hilton Hotel. It was a normal day. There was nothing out of the norm. In fact, it was really an unremarkable day. And together, we'll make America great again. Thank you very much. I proceeded to the president as he departed the stage toward the motorcade. Busy with their main priority of protecting President Ronald Reagan, Secret Service officers failed to notice the man. The future of the world, in some ways, changes in the next 30 seconds. But his face is soon on the front page of every newspaper in the world. His name is John Hinckley, and he is a stalker. Pulls out a six-shot, 22 caliber gun, and unleashes six shots in 1.7 seconds. <laughs> 1 1.7 seconds is the time it takes me to say 1.7 seconds. We had shot fired, shot fired, our commander's there. I could see that he was still firing. That opportunity to shoot Hinckley was milliseconds. But despite his headline-grabbing shooting, Reagan is not the object of Hinckley's fascination. For a number of years, he's been obsessed with the actress Jodie Foster. He thinks, how can I impress Jodie Foster? I know how I'll impress Jodie Foster. I'll get the president. On the day of the shooting, he actually wrote Jody a letter saying, please give me a chance. I'm doing this historical deed to get your attention. This is the story of how he stalked the actress and how his bizarre actions threw the United States government into chaos and nearly led to the death of the world's most powerful. In 1981, two internationally famous actors were to find their lives on a collision course which was to end in near tragedy. One was Jodie Foster, the child acting sensation who had shot to international fame for her role in the movie Taxi Driver. The other was Ronald Reagan, the former Hollywood star of the 1940s and 50s, now globally famous in his new role as the 40th president of the United States. Bible and raise your right hand. So help me God. Now I congratulate you, sir. People don't understand how crazy this day was. It changed the world. Neither of them had ever met, nor had either ever met the man who would cause their names to be inextricably linked. His name was John Hinckley. John Hinckley was born in 1955 in Ardmore, Oklahoma, but moved with his family to Dallas, Texas at the age of four. His father was a successful businessman, and John and his siblings enjoyed all of the trappings of a privileged upbringing. In University Park, Texas, he attended Highland Park School in Dallas County. During his early years, he played football, basketball, hockey, soccer, and baseball. He learned to play the piano, and he was elected class president twice. But during the late 1970s, he began to develop mental issues and was prescribed antidepressants and tranquilizers to deal with these emotional issues. He also began purchasing weapons and practicing with them. Most of all, John was a loner, and it was clear he was searching, looking for something, a role model, we're all attracted by celebrities. There are role models, our reference idols in society. Uh, and stalkers feel the same way. But for them, uh, they're looking desperately to feel loved, to get attention from important people because somehow they feel it makes them important. It gives them a sense of power and strength uh, that they don't otherwise have. As John's mental condition continued to deteriorate, he began to fixate on one person. <laughs> Jody 
Jodie Foster was born in Los Angeles and she actually started acting at a very young age, at just three years old. She got her big break because her mom actually brought her brother in for a casting and the casting directors actually fell in love with her. So she appeared when she was younger in over 50 TV shows and made her film debut in 1972. But one movie had catapulted her to global stardom. She started working with Martin Scorsese. That actually led to her role in Taxi Driver. Now that movie came in 1976 when she was just 12 years old. And this was a very controversial role because she was playing a young prostitute. Now this movie centered around Robert De Niro's character who was a taxi driver that became obsessed with this woman and wanted to impress her by assassinating a presidential candidate. John Hinckley became obsessed with the movie, its characters, and its story. He watched the movie about 15 times, and that is where he got introduced to Jodie Foster. The movie became a central part of his delusional fantasies, and Jodie Foster, the object of his affections. John Hinckley fell in love with this 12-year-old prostitute girl in this movie, and that's pretty much what drew him to her. He fell in love with her persona, her look, how she carried herself. He fell madly in love with her and wanted to impress her, so he pretty much took on the persona of Robert De Niro's character and came up with these massive plots and twists in his head to impress Jodie Foster. While Hinckley's attitude to Jodie was benign and affectionate, he was cooking up a plan to get her attention, one by which its very audacity would capture the attention of the whole world. And his crazy dream was about to become a reality. He felt like the character in Taxi Driver who tried to kill a political figure, that he, that he could gain uh, a relationship with Jodie Foster by taking the life of the president. Hinckley's obsession with Foster largely arose from the role she had played in the movie, but that had been in 1976, when the actress was just 14. Now a confident young woman, Foster was pursuing a degree in literature at Yale University in Connecticut. Jodie Foster actually decided to go to Yale at pretty much the height of her career because she was afraid that her career could eventually be over at just at the age of 18. So she enrolled in college, and what better place to do that than Yale University? But Hinckley knew a lot about Foster. He knew where she was, and he knew what she was doing. Hinckley was the prototypical stalker. He hunted down Jodie Foster. He was slipping notes on her door, he was calling her. He even got her on the phone and talked to her on the phone, trying to entice her to like be his girlfriend or something. It was so bizarre. We know this because he tape recorded the calls and they are just so sad. He's a guy calling her and he hears her friends laughing in the background and he goes, what are they laughing at? She says, they're laughing at you. What is this? Who is this? Who is this? John. Oh, no, not you, kid. Look, I really can't talk to you, okay? But dude, dude, do me a really big favor. You understand why I can't, you know, carry on these conversations with people? I don't know. You understand that it's dangerous and it's just not done, it's not fair, and it's rude. Oh, All right? Well, I have to, this well I understand that. But it's just, it's the same thing. Okay? Yeah. So you just don't ever want to be tired? No. It's been we'll really see. nice talking to you. His relationship could never have happened with this Hollywood star who was a student at Yale University. But he couldn't say no. He couldn't take no for an answer. This is a typical behavior of stalkers that are obsessed with celebrities. They literally will do anything to get their attention, whether that be sending love notes, threatening emails, anything for them to get noticed. In 
It was clear that John Hinckley was a troubled young man. His behavior fitted a classic delusional pattern. The individuals who target celebrities tend to be people who are, they're more likely to be psychotic. They generally will have just a, a distorted perception of their relationship with this person. It's hard to imagine that's not what we would call delusional. That can come from any number of disorders. There are two or three different mental disorders that will result in or, or can lead to delusional beliefs. But anytime someone has a fixed belief that is out of touch with reality, we're gonna label that as a delusion. Some people have a delusion that's sort of isolated from the rest of their functioning. They sound and look perfectly normal. They go to work, they come home, but they've harbored these beliefs that no one else shares, and, and that's a delusional disorder. Some people are more grossly disorganized, and they have more of a schizophrenia, and people with schizophrenia will often, they're typically developed delusions. And those are two of the most common disorders that explain some of these more extreme cases where the person really seems to be genuinely out of touch with reality. They think, you know, once I get to the doorstep, I'll be embraced with open arms. And they believe that. But many would come to see Hinckley as a product of his environment, the product of a deteriorating society. By the end of the 1970s, the United States was struggling. The racial tensions of the 1960s had been further compounded in the following decade by the Vietnam War, the Watergate scandal, and the international humiliation of the Iran hostage crisis. American prestige and self-esteem was at an all-time low. When Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, he promised to turn all of that around. We can, and so help us God, we will make America great again. Thank you very much. Ronald Reagan is one of the quintessential and most interesting figures in 20th century America. He was born the son of an alcoholic shoe salesman in rural Illinois. He was destined for like basically nothing, but he was very ambitious. Got through college in the Great Depression, and then he became like this radio star. He like broadcast baseball games over the radio in Iowa. But Reagan wanted more. Deeply ambitious guy. He would go on to be an actor. I mean, B-level actor, but he did act in some very famous movies. And he would go on to be the president of the Screen Actors Guild. And he would go on to be governor of California, the nation's largest state, before entering into national politics. Reagan's election was seen as a new dawn for American politics. When he got into politics, you know, he used his charisma and charm, which he had developed over his long career, to kind of build this brand of this like kind of truth-telling guy who was very good at simplifying complex things. And he was like a cowboy. John Hinckley, meanwhile, had intensified his pursuit of Jodie Foster. Phoned her incessantly, hoping to gain a relationship with her. And instead, she rejected him time and time again. And finally, he decided that the only way that he was ever going to have a relationship was to gain a lot of publicity by assassinating a well-known political figure. He decided to assassinate the President of the United States. Just four months earlier in December 1980, an obsessed fan had assassinated John Lennon outside his apartment building in New York City. In retrospect, it seems unwise that Jodie Foster or her management didn't take more heed of Hinckley's protestations of love. This is not new. His mental illness started long before he went after Ronald Reagan. During the 1980 campaign to impress Jodie Foster to win her appeal, he decides he's gonna get the president. He stalks Jimmy Carter on the campaign trail. He goes to Dayton, Ohio, where the president is giving an address. He gets within arm's reach of the president. But Hinckley had left his guns at the bus depot. He didn't take a shot. He had changed his mind. He's like, he was at, in Nashville and he's like, you know, I'm gonna get Carter. 
And he's like, you know, I changed my mind. I'm gonna go to New Haven and see Jody. So he gets the gun is caught by you know the screener at the airport as he's trying to take it on a plane. And that's when he gets arrested. So there was no real nexus. It wasn't like he was caught with a gun at a presidential event. You know, there was no, and he didn't admit to the people who got the gun, yeah, by the way, I'm in town to go shoot the president. $62 fine and sent on his way. In November 1980, Ronald Reagan won the presidency by a landslide, and Jimmy Carter slipped off the list of John Hinckley's priority targets. In May of 1981, John Hinckley traveled across the United States. He's on a cross-country mission at this point in time, Hinckley. He's actually going to New Haven, Connecticut that morning to kill, to kill Foster, kill them both, her and then him. But that morning when he wakes up on a transfer, like the bus, he took a bus from LA to DC to transfer to a bus to New Haven, Connecticut. He got off the bus, got a hotel room because he had to wait the next day to get the bus to New Haven. And he sees a newspaper that has the president's schedule in it. And he's gonna be speaking at the Washington Hilton Hotel at 2 p.m. And Hinckley decides, you know what? This is how I'll impress her. I'll get the president this time. The love he was showing and the manner in which he was hoping to gain the attention of the object of his desire would shock the world and would rock the government of the United States to its foundations. It's very difficult to tell what went on in Hinckley's head. He definitely had some mental illness, but in his mind, he thought that shooting the president would endear him to Foster, that she would actually respect and recognize him. John's choice of action was to have wide-ranging international repercussions and was to throw the U.S. government into chaos. He thinks, how can I impress Jodie Foster? I know how I'll impress Jodie Foster. I'll get the president. On March 28th, Hinckley had arrived in Washington by bus. He checked into the Park Central Hotel and studied the president's schedule for the next few days. On the morning of the 30th, he wrote but did not mail a letter to Foster. He said that he hoped to impress her with the magnitude of his action. As Hinckley is in his hotel room about to leave in the taxi to go shoot Reagan, he writes a letter to Jody Foster in which he says, Jody, I'm doing this basically for you. If I'm successful in my chance to get Reagan, you will really know who I am. It's just astonishing that he would put that in writing. Reagan, meanwhile, was due to arrive for a lunchtime speech at the Hilton. Danny Spriggs was a central part of the Secret Service detail that day. The agents that are assigned to the President of Protective Division, that is their full assignment. That's their assignment 24-7, and they work in shifts. And so whenever the President goes uh, anywhere, leaving the White House, and while he's at the White House, those group of agents are constantly with him. The Washington field office assigned me on that day to be the intelligence coordinator for the president's movement to the Washington Hilton Hotel. Spriggs's unit was on the lookout for anything unusual. My responsibility was to gather all information that uh, was associated with the visit. That includes looking at the president's itinerary, who he was going to meet with, as well as who our contact folks were at whoever was hosting the event. On that particular day, me and my partner, we reviewed all the information that was available to us relative to any individuals or groups that might present a danger to the president during this movement. But there was nothing unusual on the intelligence radar. It was a normal day. There was nothing out of the norm, if you will, as far as crowds, the events, protesters, which there were none, uh, and any of the uh, activity that was going on at the hotel that presented a, a problem for us. It, it, there was just nothing that uh, concerned us. In fact, it was really an unremarkable day. But the Secret Service had become increasingly concerned for the presidential safety at public events. They had been pushing these magnetometers, you know, metal detectors, when you go through an airport, pushing them to allow them to use those things at events the president was at. And the White House kept saying, no, 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 it's going to offend everyone. We can't do that. But the familiarity of the location gave them, and the agent in charge, Jerry Parr, some reassurance. The presidential detail had been to the Hilton more than 100 times in the last decade with the president. He went there a lot. 
They were so complacent. Jerry Parr told me our biggest failing, we were so complacent. It didn't dawn on us to wear vests. We didn't think of pushing that rope line back. We'd just done it so many times, it was so rote. This is the Hilton, this is what we do. The president entered the Hilton at 1.45 p.m. He spoke for nearly half an hour. Following the president's speech, my job, after having been satisfied that the posted agents had no information relative to any suspicious activity or suspicious persons that they may observe during the course of the speech, I proceeded to the president as he departed the stage toward the motorcade. Meanwhile, Hinckley had positioned himself in a small alcove, about 20 feet from where Reagan had entered the building just behind a small group of well-wishers who had been allowed to gather behind a rope line. I was actually there and, and tested it. I, I, I walked into the secret hiding place and found that nobody could see me at all. It was a perfect place to hide if, if you were trying to, to avoid detection. At 2.27, the president walked from the hotel. As he walked toward the car, there was a crowd across the street that were acknowledging him, trying to get his attention and whatnot. Hinckley stepped out of his secret hiding place. Pulls out a six-shot, 22 caliber gun, and unleashes six shots in 1.7 seconds. 1.7 seconds is the time it takes me to say 1.7 seconds. That's how fast he gets it off. First shot, hits Jim Brady, the press secretary, in the head. He falls to the ground. The second shot hits Tom Delahanty, a DC police officer, in the back. He had been looking the wrong way. He falls to the ground. The way to Reagan should be clear. But Jerry Parr, the 50-year-old head of the Secret Service detail, is already reacting. He's reacting before his mind can even process their bullets been fired. He's shoving Reagan towards that open limousine door. Hinkley's third shot goes high and hits a building across the street. Shot fired. Shot fired. Uh, one Once the shots rang out, it was almost like muscle memory, instinctive moves by every special agent to include myself. I immediately went toward my weapon and actually had my weapon pointed in his direction. I could see that he was still firing. The reason why I did not fire is because I thought an agent come across my line of fire. That opportunity to shoot Hinckley was milliseconds. The four shot hits Tim McCarthy, a Secret Service agent in the chest, spread wide, takes a bullet without a bulletproof vest. This shot hits the bulletproof window of the limousine. Because it was a backward opening door, it saves the Reagan's life again. That bullet slaps against the bulletproof window. The sixth shot echoes across the, the driveway. No one realizes at the time. It slaps against the limousine, slips through a gap that wide between the door and the door frame, and hits Reagan under the left armpit. They tumble in the door. The door slams shut. Reagan and Parr are in the back. The driver of the car, Drew Unruh, slams down the accelerator, praying he doesn't run over his friend Tim McCarthy, who's on the ground, because it will kill him. So my only option at that time was to move toward the assailant. Once I reached the assailant, I wanted to make sure, one, that we had him under control, two, that we had possession of the weapon, and three, whether or not there were other assailants, whether there was, this was a diversion. Once that was accomplished, I looked around and I saw Jim Brady, the press secretary, bleeding profusely from the head, and I knew that he needed assistance. That is when I hollered out, get him out of here, get him out of here. Get him out! Get him out! I was referring to James Brady because uh, I had never experienced anything like that, a person bleeding from the head. There was pandemonium. You know, people were screaming and asking for help. It was chaotic from the standpoint of all of the spectators that were around and the people who were around the immediate vicinity of Hinckley were pretty much in shock. Once we took custody of him, we moved toward 
a marked Metropolitan Police car. The first car basically we couldn't get in. As far as I was concerned, it was taking too long. Officer Swain from the Metropolitan Police Department drove up in another car. That's the car we went to. Once we had gotten Hinckley in the car, I directed Officer Swain, Metropolitan Police Department, to take us to Metropolitan Police Department Central Cell Block. That was the holding area that was their temporary jail. Hinckley's not saying anything. He's pretty stoic. He's looking around. I think he's I'm just thinking that he's trying to digest what is taking place here. Halfway to Metropolitan Police Central Cell Block, he asked for the scores of the NCAA college basketball tournament. Dennis used a couple of expletives in describing to him that we didn't know what the scores were. And he said nothing after that. The hotel was in utter chaos. They grabbed Hinckley, threw him in a police car, and drove him straight to DC police headquarters, where the homicide detectives are. They did that because they felt it would be the most secure place to put him, because the last thing they wanted was another Jack Ruby situation. Remember, this incident is only 18 years after Kennedy had been killed. And you know all the conspiracy theories that had come out. They wanted no conspiracies. They wanted nothing to happen to Hinckley. Once we got to Central Cell Block, one of the first things that became somewhat contentious in that there were homicide detectives there who knew that they had an officer down and they wanted custody of Hinckley. My role as the intelligence coordinator was not to release anybody to another law enforcement agency until we had gotten more information. Once we got there, my main concern was not so much who had jurisdiction, but to identify, in this case, the attempted assassin. So Hickley made sure that he was going to be identified because he had all kind of picture ID and other things with his name on it, which made identifying him very easy. My partner's there with me. We're in the holding room. I'm on the phone calling back to my command post as to the identity of the individual that we had. Within hours, the White House was in total confusion. Hinckley was in custody, but no one knew if the President of the United States was going to live or die. Reagan's entire presidency, in fact, the future of the world in some ways, changes in the next 30 seconds. The attempted assassination set off a chain of events which left the U.S. government in a state of total confusion. Now, in this car, they're peeling away. Reagan and Parr. As they pull around on T Street, they take off down Connecticut Avenue. The way to the White House is completely clear because they shut down Connecticut Avenue. They were going straight to the White House. Reagan and Parr actually checked Reagan out. He rubbed his hands up and down his side, checked his face. He looked OK. Reagan was complaining about a little pain in his side from where he'd been thrown in, Parr thought, into the car and hurt his side when he, or back when he landed. So Parr gets on them, makes him get on the radio and says, hey, Rawhide is okay. Follow up. Rawhide is okay. You want to go to the hospital or back to the White House? We're going, we're going to ground. Okay. We're heading to Crown. Crown being the White House. That's the code name for the White House. They're heading back to the White House. This is a smart move at this moment because the White House is the most secure place in the universe. There are more guns at the White House by any other place in DC. This guy could be a legitimately good assassin. He got six shots off super fast, hit all these people. Only by the grace of God did Reagan not get hit, they think. They're taken off. But events change dramatically in seconds. Reagan pulls a napkin out of his pocket, of his jacket that he had taken from the event at the Hilton, and dabs his lip, and there's bright, frothy blood. Well, bright, frothy blood tells Parr it's from the lungs, not a lip. Oh, that's not good. Jerry Parr realizes something much more serious has happened, and he makes one of the most consequential decisions in U.S. presidential history. He's gone, Drew. Roger, we want to go to the emergency room of uh, George Washington. That's the Roger. Go to George Washington fast. 
Maybe I broke a rib, he thinks, and it punctured a lung. What do I do? Reagan, meanwhile, is complaining more and more of pain. So Parr makes this consequential decision. We're not going to the White House anymore, which, by the way, has its own medical facility. We're going to go to divert to George Washington University Hospital. They reached the hospital three minutes after the shooting. Reagan insists on walking inside under his own power. Very cowboy-esque. He even, when he gets out of the limousine, hitches up his pants. President Reagan understood that the world is a stage. And this was his role to play. And the President of the United States is not helped into the emergency room. He walks. He got about 20 feet inside the hospital. A paramedic who was there, just by chance, who saw Reagan coming in. Reagan was ashen. He watched the President's eyes roll in the back of his head as he collapsed into the arms of his agents. Reagan just collapsed. And the paramedic said, I think the President is Code City. He's going to die. That particular day, I was in charge of the trauma team, and I got a call, uh, Dr. Giordano, stat for the ER, which in itself was very unusual because I never get called stat to the ER. So I went right down and uh, walked into uh, the ER. It was a little strange. There was a lot of people around I never saw before. Uh, there was Secret Service. I went into the uh, emergency room, and then I went into the resuscitation room, and there he was. I asked him what was going on and so forth, and he says, I think I've been shot. There's an emergency, a trauma. Everyone has a job to do, and you do the job very quickly. No questions, no orders. Everything is done the same way. Rain gets there, they put him on the, on the gurney. A nurse takes out a big pair of scissors and cuts the suit off him. A nurse inserts an IV line, three-foot IV line from Reagan's right arm to his heart to get more fluid there and to read pressure. Only then does she look up, look around and go, wait a minute, what are these guys with guns? And, oh, that's the president. She freezes. This is a serious problem and I gotta move quickly. And so I didn't have a lot of time to dwell on it, and I didn't dwell on it. He came in with a blood pressure that was barely palpable. Another nurse is trying to get the president's blood pressure. She can't detect it, which means he's in shock. He may not make it. She begins to cry. She thought the president was going to crash and die right there in front of her. She had a flashback to the one time she saw her father cry on that November day in 1963 when she came home and learned that John F. Kennedy had been killed. She was convinced Reagan would die. He was at the point where we say he would have crashed. In other words, he was at the point where his blood pressure was so low, the next thing was down to zero. Reagan had a highly scripted presidency, the most scripted ever up to that point. And that script got thrown out at 2.27 PM when Hinckley unloaded that gun. There's no script the rest of the day. I didn't know that the president had been hit. I saw Jim Brady hit. Officer Delahanty from the Metropolitan Police Department had been wounded. I knew that. And I didn't know the severity of Tim McCarthy, Special Agent Tim McCarthy's wounds. My concern at that time was, you know, I had him in custody. We needed to make sure that we followed all the necessary protocols, because one of the things that I reflected upon with doing this whole process was the Kennedy assassination. I wanted to make sure that there was not going to be any hiccups, if you will, relative to any procedures that would cause this individual to be able to, you know, skirt what was really a major, major attempt at it, to kill a president. The Secret Service agents and the police who questioned him had never confronted anything like this. He was as calm as a cucumber, not worried about anything. He seemed very interested in what happened. He wanted to know, was he successful? And he was so strange. At one point, the police detective is typing up his report and asks the agent, how do you spell the word assassinate? And Hinkley interrupts it. I know how to spell it, and I'll spell it for you. And he spelled it correctly. But as night fell in the US Capitol, there was confusion about the president's condition. Meanwhile, back at the hospital, the doctors need to do something. Right? His bleeding will not stop. 
On this day, Ronald Reagan loses more than half his blood volume. He's a 70-year-old man. A 70-year-old man shot today loses more than half his blood volume. More than 50% die today. It's really interesting. They didn't know Reagan had been shot yet. You know, they get his blood pressure up there. Is he having a heart attack? Did he puncture a lung? What happened? And this doctor, you know, puts on the stethoscope and checks Reagan's breathing. On the right side, it's hollow. He puts it on the right side, it's hollow. On the left side, when he puts it on Reagan's left side, it's like solid, because it's so filled with blood. It's solid. That's bad. And this intern is there, and he comes up, and he had been a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, very familiar with gunshot wounds. He comes over. He's not even supposed to be there. He looks down, sees a tiny little slit in Reagan's left side. He goes, he's been shot. What? And everyone looks, and there's no blood coming out. It's a little bit. So what had happened was the bullet had ricocheted off the side of the limousine, flattened in the shape of a dime, hit him edgewise, tumbled through his lung, churning up arteries and everything, causing the bleeding. But not a lot of blood escaped. You know, when you get shot by a bullet, and it's like a hollow point round or a regular bullet, you're going to bleed a lot. But the way this hit, there wasn't a lot of bleeding. It just did a lot of internal damage. That's why they didn't know. The key thing was the blood loss. He lost a lot of blood. We found that he had an entrance room right under the left axilla, the armpit. And uh, with no breathing on that side, I put a chest tube in, which is standard therapy, to re-expand the lung and get rid of the blood that's there. And a considerable amount of blood came out. Uh, which is a great concern. Most of these cases can be handled just with the chest tube, but it was clear from the amount of blood that was coming out that that was not what was going to happen. The blood just keeps going and going and going, filling these bags. It doesn't stop, which is unusual. You know, the president had an enormous presence about himself, and despite the fact that this was not a good situation, he was shot, he was in pain, he was lying on a gurney, he was stark naked. There was about five or six, you know, people around him who he didn't know and so forth like that. He maintained a good sense of humor. The president's condition was on a knife edge. You can't fake it when you've been shot. And the doctors and nurses all attested that Reagan had been pretty brave this day. And there's a true indicator of that. When Nancy Reagan gets there, and the first thing Ronald Reagan says to her, he looks at her and says, honey, I forgot to duck. He looked at me directly and I said, I hope you're all Republicans. And I said, today, we are all Republicans. In the operating theater, the high drama of the afternoon continued. People don't understand how crazy this day was. People think Reagan was winged, just hit, he was fine. This is how crazy this day was. As Reagan is being operated on, and the chief surgeon is hunting frantically for the bullet in Reagan's chest, trying to find it, a 33-year-old surgical intern reaches his hand into Reagan's chest, gently cups the president's beating heart in his hand, and holds it aside to give the surgeon more room to find the bullet. Think about that. An unscreened doctor in a room surrounded by Secret Service agents dressed in medical garb, ready to pounce at the slightest misstep, not even really knowing what the misstep would be. This dude held the beating heart of the president in his hand. The president was safe, but at the White House, things were not under control. What can you tell us about the gunman who's in custody? Absolutely nothing. That would have to come to the Secret Service of the police. The White House was a mess. Let's not forget, no one knew who Hinckley was at the time. No one knew that, you know, Reagan might live or die. It was very up in the air for a while. It gets so chaotic. They're being trying to be so careful about what message to send to the world, the government's running the show, that Larry Speaks, the spokesman, had been at the hospital. Suddenly, they look up and he's on TV in the briefing room, giving a briefing. But he can't answer the question. Are they in President surgery, in surgery? I can't say. Larry, his brother's been called by the White House and has been told that the president is in surgery right now that he's already had blood transfusions. Is your information going to be that far behind what we're getting from other no, sources? Lester, we will do our very best to keep it up. Could so you check the on the surgery and come back? phone call or something? I, I, I will. So it either looked two ways. One, he's lying, which is pretty bad. Or two, more likely, he didn't know. The government didn't know what was going on. That is awful. Surgery's done, they get the bullet, it's just an inch from his heart. Let's put that in perspective. More than half his blood is lost, the bullet was lodged an inch from his heart. He's 70 years old, he survives. 
Ronald Reagan survived his ordeal and in time would become one of the most popular presidents in U.S. history. What the public learns about Reagan on this day, you know, his, his quips, his one-liners, they were looking for a guy like that. They were looking for someone who was stoic and brave in the face of this kind of danger to face the Soviet Union and do things like that. And they got it with him, right? Like, the, his public popularity soared after this when they learned that he had said, honey, I forgot the duck. He had been brave in the face of death. So Reagan definitely was more popular than ever because the American people had formed a bond, not just like, hey, a relative had been hurt, we, you love him more, you know, but kind of like they built a bond with him because they saw how brave he had been in the face of this danger. He spent 11 days in the hospital, was released, went back to the White House, had a very slow schedule to recover. But within a month, he delivered an address to the joint session of Congress. Pinkley, I had gone into thinking, yeah, he almost changed history, but he really did. I mean, the, if without this day, Reagan's presidency is much, much different, I believe. As investigators began to question Hinckley in detail, the reason for his attack on Reagan and his obsession with Jodie Foster became clear. She wanted nothing to do with him, but in his mind, this was an obsession. He could not get rid of it. He, it this was so important to him that he was willing to actually give up his own life in order to, to attract attention to her. Hinckley's trial began on the 1st of May, 1982. The outcome was a surprise to some. He was charged with 13 offenses, but he was actually found not guilty by reason of insanity. John Hinckley is one of the most clear-cut examples of someone who was not guilty by reason of insanity. As a result, a couple of things happened after the trial. First of all, the insanity defense criteria became much stricter. In many states, the insanity defense was uh, limited because people were concerned that Hinckley had gotten away with murder. After the attempt on Reagan, Jodie Foster's career, too, never looked back. Her career really did not take a hit from this. She just continued to gain momentum. She had two Oscar wins under her belt for Accused and The Silence of the Lambs. She went on to get a Cecil B. DeMille Award in 2013 at the Golden Globes. So her career really hit a pinnacle point. But she never talked about this incident. She never wanted to relive this. It was a very dark, scary time in her life. She's very a private person because of this. She doesn't talk about her personal life. She doesn't do a lot of interviews. She has said in the very few times that she has spoken out about this incident that she was frightened, that she was scared, that she was shocked, but she doesn't like to talk about it because she doesn't want this to define her. She wants her career to define her. But I'm sure late at night or on the anniversary of the shooting, it must come and haunt her. But it's the what might have happened that defines the stalking of Jodie Foster by John Hinckley. His obsession almost led to a tragedy that could have changed the world. Now, he was a total stalker. It just by chance, by sheer chance, that he was in DC that day, and sheer chance that he saw the newspaper, and sheer chance that he got to the Hilton in time. All these things had to line up perfectly for that day to happen. And for Reagan to survive, everything had to go just the right way. Like, we were on a razor's edge this whole day. I mean, if one little thing goes wrong, Jerry Parr's a little slow, Reagan's dead. Jerry Parr goes to the White House, Reagan's dead. The doctors don't have the right protocols on place, Reagan's dead. But what is it about Hinckley and others like him that drives this obsession with famous people? Somehow they believe in their delusional world that they too will become important, that they too will somehow gain the power that they see in their victims. Um, and it's this hallucinatory image that they gain that differs from the ordinary stalker who is a sociopath, who lacks a conscience. These 
Celebrity stalkers have a very strong conscience. They believe they're doing the right thing. If you think that this behavior is gonna win you the affection of somebody, you'd have to be crazy.